Well, Sister Kellenberger, I wanted to say particularly we appreciate your presence here tonight, Amen. you and the girls. Amen. You have a welcome spot here whenever you come. We, we appreciate it very much. Yes, <clears throat> We're in the book of Philemon. This will be our fifth, uh, fifth lesson in it. It's one of those letters, a very personal letter written to an individual. And we'll uh, see a lot of things here that uh, are not really seen in any other book. It's kind of unique, but it uh, you'll get a lot of benefit from it. Now, you'll learn from the apostolic writings. Shall I say you learn from the inspired writings? That the saints need to hear what they've received from God. Amen. What is in them. See, all the people of God have things God has put in them that they may not be aware that they're there. Because it's hard to use something if you don't know you got it. Now, when you talk about this, this is not the sort of thing you'd like say once. You know, that, that's it. It's not like that. <laughs> There's a reason why. It's because we're, we're pilgrims in the world. We're, we're journeying through it. And quite frankly, it's a hostile world. <clears throat> in fact, the God of the world is Satan. We're going to his territory en route to glory. Yeah. And he's uh, not happy about the whole thing. Amen. Amen. He's a fierce adversary. Yeah. He's smart. Yeah. Shrewd. Be a better. He's shrewd. Mm -hmm. yeah. Crafty. Amen. He's tripped up everybody in the human race. Yeah, right. <laughs> the only people he hasn't having success with are the people that are in Christ. Yeah. They were once his victims too. So it's a, it's a dangerous territory we're going through, but it's barren too, mm -hmm. spiritually barren. That is, there's spiritual foods not, not laying around on the ground. Yeah. We're negotiating our way through this desert, this spiritual desert. And as I mentioned, it's not uninhabited territory. <laughs> the prince of the world is here. And his lieutenants are here. Principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of the darkness of this world. These are these are not men. Yeah. Amen. As Paul said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. These are potent spiritual powers that have dominated whole nations and regions. Right. We're wrestling against them. And you think maybe that'd be enough? That's not. That's not all. We're we've got a treasure of God, the treasure of salvation. We're toting it around in an earthen vessel or a clay pot. Your body. And it's like this body is like a handicap. <laughs> it wears out before your spirit wears out. You, you probably found this out. Right in the middle of some great thing, you fall asleep. Yeah. But you get tired. The, the earthen vessel, yeah, right. it's leaky. Yeah. Just stuff gets away from you. That's a handicap. And then you've got the law of sin in your members. A propensity or inclination to sin. There's something in you that wants to sin. Yeah, right. You wish it wasn't there, but it's there. God don't impute it to you or credit it to you if you really subdue it. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is let yourself go. Boy, you don't realize what you could do. There's some people shoot up a school of little children. Yeah, right. yeah. People surprised. What, what, what happened? Ah, uh, the prince of the power of darkness. Yeah, that's, right. yeah. that's what he can make a person do. 
See, these people that have fallen away, they don't know this. And none of us know it like we already ought to know it. In a moment of time, they can do something that will boggle your mind. You could never figure out where they did it. That's the kind of thing that we're dealing with in the world here. And then we've got... Uh, we're. We're, we've got our own members. That's our your members are your capacities to express. You've got a law in your members, warring against the law of your mind. <laughs> it's, there's a competition. When you would do good, here comes some temptation to do something else. You've got to crucify the flesh. Mortify your members. See, these are these are why you have to be told what you have. These are why the, now the devil, he'll tell you what he's got. He'll tell you what's available in the world. He'll stick it out in front of your nose and let you see it. So people got to, preachers and teachers got to tell the people of God what they have and what's in them, and they can't quit. Yeah, it is. Oh, now we finally arrived. Now we see it all and we don't have to do it. Oh, no. We're in the battle zone yet. Amen. We're just not talking about spiting pious platitudes, having nice religious sayings, you know, and spouting them. That's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> we, I want, I trust I'm speaking for everybody, when you leave here tonight, to take something with you Amen. that'll make a difference Amen. in the good fight of faith. Amen. Something that'll make you think a little deeper, Amen. see a little further, Amen. feel a little stronger. That's what we want. All right, that's something we're going to see in this text tonight. Is Philippians 1, 6. That the communication... Of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> well, one thing you have to say about that verse, it does make you think, doesn't it? Maybe if I read that a second time, it'll clear up. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. All right, now we're, we're going to go to work on the text. Now let's first look at the word that. That's an important word. That. It's the first word, that. Some versions read, and I pray, or in such sort that, so that, as you, or you will. Now, the reference here is to the prayer he'd been praying. He said, verse 4, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. All right, that's what he's He's going to tell you what he makes mention of now in his prayers for Paul, for Philemon. Prayers are not like arrows shot into the air. I hear, I've heard a lot of prayers that just like pump and shoot an arrow in the air. It's not aimed at anything. It just falls out there in the field someplace. Well, I prayed prayers like that myself. Had to repent for praying stupid prayers. Thoughtless prayers. Prayers that really were just kind of like a formality. Kind of like we thank you for this beautiful day. Or we thank you for this food. Just a kind of a habitual. Paul didn't pray like that. And we must not either. See, praying should have an objective. It should have like a target. You're aiming at it. A target. I'm persuaded this has escaped a lot of well-intentioned prayers. They don't have a, 
and remember John. For what? And give Mary strength. For what? What's the objective? Make them well, Lord. Take away their disease. Why? What's the aim? Just so they'll be well? Is that it? <laughs> that has to do with the target. We might say, in order that. I'm making mention of you in my prayers so that verse 6 can happen. Now, I want to dwell a little bit on this because it's my persuasion that there's been a lot of weak preaching concerning prayer. And some of it I preached myself. There's not been enough definition of purpose. So I'm, I'm going to go to the premier prayer, who is Jesus, and I'm going to show you in his most lengthy recorded prayer, I'm going to show you what having a target means. Amen. Now the word that is mentioned several times in this prayer. I have preceded the word that within order that because that's the sense of the text. Now listen to these words. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son in order that thy son may glorify thee. See, there's the, there's the objective, see. Amen. He continues. As thou hast given him power over all flesh in order that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. See, I'm telling you the yeah. praying with a target. And this is eternal life in order that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ from thy sin. So why exactly do you have eternal life? So that you can know God. That is, be familiar with God. Uh, be able to recognize God. Be able, be able to tell someone else what God's really like. Know God in Jesus Christ to be sent. All right, now listen to this. This word comment on that. And now I am no more in the world, even though, even though it looked like he was. <laughs> it looked like he was in the world. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was in the world. He said, I'm not in the world now, Father. I'm not in the world now. I'm no longer in the world. But these are in the world, his disciples. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. Keep them, Lord. Keep. Why? Why keep them? In order that they may be one. They'll get split up. They'll get divided. If you don't keep them, Lord, they'll start. Yeah. Now you know why there's so many divisions. Amen. Now you know they hadn't been kept. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's no polite way to really dress it up or make it sound nice, but keep them in order that. Remember, I'm talking about an objective in prayer, praying with a Amen. target in mind. Now I come to thee in these things I speak in the world in order that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So, Lord, Father, unless I say something, my joy is not going to be fulfilled in them. So I'm coming to you in prayer. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to you, and I'm, I'm saying these things so that my joy can be fulfilled in them. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but well, why do you pray then? Why aren't you praying for to take them out of the world? They don't feel at home in the world. They're not of the world. The world's against them. They don't love the world. So why not take them out of the world? I'm not praying to take them out of the world, but in order that thou shouldst keep them from evil. <laughs> now, you, there isn't any evil in heaven, so you're not kept from evil in heaven. But Father, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of succeeding generations I want you to keep these so they can see mm -hmm. you can keep them from evil. Mm -hmm. I want them to live this out. Keep them from evil so that every one of them finish the work you gave them to do. Amen. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. 
That is, I dedicate myself completely, 100% to what you sent me to do. Why are you doing that? In order that they also may be sanctified through the truth. He knew. If I don't sanctify myself, my disciples aren't going to be able to sanctify themselves. And it could be that maybe there's some poor soul out there that can't sanctify themselves because you haven't sanctified yourself. You've been half-hearted, and it looks like it justifies somebody else being half-hearted. Or maybe you've been quarter-hearted, or eighth-hearted, or no-hearted, and it seemed to justify to other people, that seemed to justify them being that way. Oh, I sanctify myself. In order that they might sanctify themselves through the truth. I'm praying, Father, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us. But, but, but why? In order that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Amen. Now, with all the talk and all the jabber about missions and evangelism and all this, the world's not going to believe that God sent Jesus until his people get together. Amen. Yeah. I'm praying that they... Uh, they might be one like we're one. You gotta, we have to be one with each other like Jesus is one with God. Amen. And let me tell you something. Until that happens, missions, personal evangelism, it's on hold. Amen. It's not going to do very much. God's very gracious, so there's a few sheaves here and there that are reaped. But it's not on any global scale. 1040 window. I've been hearing about the 1040 window for 30 years, and the 1040 window still just exactly like it was 30 years ago. Same thing. We talk. People think they think that's holy to talk about the 1040 window where nothing's happened for 30 years that I know about. Amen. Why has it happened? I'll tell you why. Because God's people are so busy squabbling among themselves, they forgot about their allegiance to Christ. Jesus prayed about that. And the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them. You did. Why did you give them that glory? In order that they may be one. <laughs> so if the church isn't united, it's not got any glory. You just, well, fess up to it. That's just what it is. They may even have a praise band, whatever accompanies a successful church, big campus. But if they're not, don't have this kind of oneness that Jesus is talking about, they've not got the glory. It's Ichabod. That ought to be the name over the church door. Ichabod. The glory departed is not here anymore. Some of these church marquees in town, they ought to have a sign say, he's not here. He is risen. And you underneath and say, why seek ye the living among the dead? Stop coming here. He's not here. Uh -huh. Now, some of these places I've been, I, I could tell he wasn't there, too. Now, don't forget what he prayed. He prayed, give them. Yeah. I've given them glory so they can be one. Then he describes it. I and them and thou and me. Boy, that's, that's some unity. That's a threefold unity. Christ is in us. God is in Christ mm -hmm. in order that they may be made perfect in one. <laughs> perfect here means like mature, mm -hmm. grown up. Believe me, we've got enough Christian babies. We don't need any more. Mm -hmm. What we need is a good dose of spiritual adulthood. Amen. How are you going to get it? <laughs> Christ in you. God in Christ, that's a good combination. You grow up. And then he adds another, and in order that the world may know thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, that's, that's his disciples, as thou hast loved me. Till somebody in the world gets the idea that God loves you more than he loves them, they're not going to make any inquiry. So, well, shouldn't we tell them that God loves them? If you can find one example in all of God's word of somebody telling a sinner God loved them, any place under either covenant from Genesis to Revelation, then you can see it. 
But I can tell you authoritatively, there's no such reference. Nobody ever said to anyone that was alienated from God or wasn't in Christ, no one ever told them God loved them. Now, you may philosophize about it. You may say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, but they didn't. The only people were told that, Jesus only told that to his disciples. He didn't say to the scribes and Pharisees, God loves you very much. He didn't say that. He only said it to his disciples, and he said, God loves you because you love me and believe I came out from God. And then from that point on, all through Scripture, every line, every single time the love of God is mentioned, it's mentioned to God's people. No other time. Does that mean he doesn't love the people? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not said to those people. Those people are told, repent. God commands you to repent. That's what he commands. Change. Do it tonight. Turn around. Quit sinning tonight. Do it. Then we'll tell you about this other wonderful love. <laughs> Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Not, Father, I want to be where they are. I want them to be where I am. Why? What's the objective? In order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. I want them to see what you think of me, Father. See, because you till you see that, to some measure, you won't be devoted to Christ. So you begin to see it now. But, oh, wait till, we, wait till we see the whole picture. <laughs> wait till we see what the Father thinks of the Son. And we behold the glory. Well, I'll tell you, that'll, it'll be worth it all. Amen. One more, I've declared unto them thy name and will declare it. In order that the lover with us love me may be in them and I in them. See, but... That's an example of objective praying. See how much there was in there about that? In order that. So in our text, Paul's going to state an intention that drove his prayer. Yes, Sister Mark. We see this in the Lord's Prayer and even in the Apostle Paul's prayers and the scriptures that are recorded that there is power in prayer whenever the objective aligns with the purpose of God. That's it. That's it. That's it. Now, see, these kind of prayers, this is how Jesus governs his kingdom. Shall I say, this is included in how Jesus governs his kingdom. The prayers of the saints are like the incense. These are, these are just not talks with God. I've heard prayers like talking with God. Go home. I mean, one thing I'm going to be glad there are not going to be stupid people in heaven. And that, that is going to, I'm anticipating that. If you tell me the truth, you know you are too. I'm looking forward to that. This sort of thing. All right, now let's get to the, what, do you, what are you praying, Paul? For Philemon. Yes. On the, the love of God, I think there's very, very little distinction made between the provision of the love of God and the experience of the love of God. Romans 5 8 says, He commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. So, there, and John 3 16, of course, it, mm -hmm. God so loved the yeah. world. And that's the provision of his love is that his love is available yeah. but it's not experienced while you're in sin no uh -huh. and it wasn't even John 3.16 that was told to Nicodemus you know who was uh, had an interest in these things so even the provision isn't the provision of love the provision of well the provision of grace wasn't announced either as a matter of fact you had to put people had to get in a position where you could make this statement otherwise they would have no idea what you meant let me listen when you say to someone out of Christ, God loves you very much, there may be a sense in which this is true, but they do not have the foggiest idea what you mean. What exactly does that mean? 
Does it mean that uh, when Jesus loved us and died for us, does that mean like he threw himself in front of a car like someone did to save a life? That's what I think people think. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't know that Jesus was more necessary to God than he was to us. Yeah, that's right. That God couldn't do anything until Jesus laid down his life. Amen. I've seen two things that people that are, are not believing do with a statement like that. If you tell somebody, well, God loves you, sometimes they'll come back with, well, if he loves me so much, how about, how come he's not doing this for me? Yeah. And how come he let that happen? Yeah. And how come I don't have this, that, or the other? Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, well, I'm doing fine. I don't need it. Right. Yeah. Again, let me, let me distinguish here. We're not saying that this love doesn't exist. We're saying it's not communicated to those who are outside of Christ because it wouldn't have any significance to them. Yeah, this is family language. That family the, language. There are certain things that the Lord has reserved for his people, just like in your own family. There are certain things that are just specifically for that time that you're with your, your family. The Lord's this way too. He he has certain things that he expresses to those who are yeah. his children. Amen. And it's not for those who are not his children. Amen. Yes, uh, that's brother, given when the law had a twerk in me, I didn't. I God loving me was not at all what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is that is not the issue mm -hmm. with someone outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. The immediate issue is that they are in conflict with God because they are in sin, mm -hmm. and that's what drove me to Christ. That's right. Without that conviction. I would have seen no need for Christ at all. That's right. When you tell an unbeliever God loves them, they get the notion they're accepted by God. Right. Yeah. And that is not true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Regardless if God loves them or not, that while they're in transgression, That's they're right. under the wrath of God. That's right. <clears throat> now, that the God abides on them. You, yeah. you, you can have wrath on people that you care about yeah. simply because they're, yeah. they're wrong. Yeah. You, can be, you can be angry about that. Yes. So that's the wrong thing to tell yep. anybody like that, to God loves them. You need to tell them that God's mad at you. As soon as, soon as someone <laughs> repents and comes to God, then we got, we got this message, this good message. Jesus said it. Here's how Jesus said it. John 14, 21. He said, if a man have my words and keeps them, I will love him. That's just what he said, John 14, 23, 21. Verse 23 says, And a man has my word and keeps it, my father will love him, Amen. and we will come into him and manifest ourselves to them. Amen. We could hold that out. I think we, we could hold that out to people. Amen. Yes, Brother Judah? Receiving of the love of God isn't a one-time event. <laughs> That's right. It's it's continual. It's renewed day by day. That's right. Have you given? Another thing. People don't have any reason to repent. Why? What do I have to repent yeah. of? It's being said so much that they don't see any reason for repentance. Yeah. yeah. They're not convicted of anything. It's very compelling um, incentive to hold out to people that if you repent and come to God, He'll He'll love you. That's right. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's what Jesus said. That's what His Son said. So there's no debate about this. Amen. And brother, given uh, also what you go off of what brother Judas said is that it's a continual thing. As mm -hmm. you were pointing out, we are porous vessels. We still have to continually yeah. supply our new man with food that he can eat. Mm -hmm. And I remember the text that says, "Keep yourself in, in the, the love of God." God. That's and, right. And, I mean, it's just that continual sanctification and washing of regeneration. The Amen. That keeps you in the love of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'm praying that the communication of your faith, the communication, the communication, <laughs> sounds like it's got to get out. Some other versions read the sharing, the sharing of your faith. I'm going to say the fellowship of your faith, active in sharing, partic partnership, participation, so forth. The word translated communication, you probably heard the word koinonia. There's some fellowships, Christian fellowships, that are named themselves the koinonia. It means fellowship or closeness or unanimity. 
the word means the idea of sharing. Me to you, you to me. Contact and fellowship and intimacy, that's all involved in there. This is, this is body talk. Yeah, right. Church is the body of Christ, that body, body talk. It's a language that speaks of the involvements of the members of the body of Christ. We're communicating. Yeah. Yeah. It assumes there's a common faith and a common salvation. We're yeah. fellowshipping with something of what I have, I pass to you. Something of you have, you pass to me. When they read terms like fellowship or communion or together or family or household, or body, or gather together, or unity of the faith, unity of the spirit. We're speaking about the children of God in assembly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, it is true that much of the church today bears some religious resemblance to Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones. They weren't even assembled. They were just a bunch of dry bones disassembled, mm -hmm. scattered all over the place. And you remember that... Uh, God said to Ezekiel, said, preach to these bones. Bones. I've had, to, I've had to preach to some bones. I have in my life. I preached to congregation of bones. I thank God that's not the case anymore. But preach to the bones. First of all, he asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? How about it, says Ezekiel? How about it? How about it? They're scattered. They're very dry. It's very dry. They've been there a long time. And they were disassembled. They weren't, these weren't skeletons. These were just, just a stack of bones yeah. disassembled. Can these bones live? Ezekiel said, thou knowest. Yeah. Can so-and-so come back? Mm -hmm. Thou knowest. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be making an official pronouncement. Right. God raises the dead. Yeah. We know some people that are excellent candidates. We've read you raise the dead. We got this dead person on our mind. He preached to the bones. They began to come together, remember? There's an old spiritual, only hip bone connected to the backbone, and there was all kind of foot bone connected to the leg bone, and they were coming together, formed skeletons. When they all got together, you had a bunch of skeletons. That's it. <laughs> bunch of skeletons. Yes. See, that's encouraging to somebody who has a loved one that you you wanted it to, uh, to tell them that the Lord loves them, but you know they're not in a position for that. That's right. We you can see this and and, and give you you can be encouraged knowing that God can work on that. Person. That's right. So you don't have to do more than you're supposed to do. That's right. Or say more than you're supposed to say. You can rely on God that can work on that Amen. person's heart. As Ezekiel preached, they got these, now you got these skeletons. Then flesh come on the skeletons. Then skin come on the skeletons. You got complete bodies, but they're still dead. You know, a bunch of, bunch of dead bodies can't do any more than a bunch of dry bones. And he says, now we're done preaching to the bones now. We're not going to preach to the bones anymore now. I want you to prophesy to the wind. Come, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Breathe upon the. We got them now in one place. Yeah. Got them all in one place now. Breathe on these slain. When he did, they stood up and they were a, an army. Yes, amen. Said, breathe upon these slain. Oh. oh, these people were murdered. Their lives had been taken from them by the old serpent. Well, body, that's I'm getting to the point that a body is the bones come together, flesh and skin on the bones, standing up a great army. That's where that's the stage we're talking about. Communication has to do with participation or an exchange going on. Communication of your faith, an exchange. Now, faith itself can't be communicated. You can't take your faith and give it to somebody else. <laughs> if you could, there's a lot of cases that would have been resolved that we know about. But you can't do that. 
Faith has to come from God directly to the person. Amen. Can't be passed on by you. So communicate your faith. He's not talking about the faith that saves the soul. That's, to, that's not the faith he's talking about here. Here, faith refers to the, the distribution of faith as it's associated with spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Now, this is taught in Scripture, so it's not, it's not strange. Yeah. Paul wrote to the Romans about this. Talking now about the communication of faith. <clears throat> he said, I say through the grace given to me, that is, I'm able to see this, to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, don't overestimate what you can do, but to think soberly according to God of the dealt to every man, the measure of faith. What is that? The measure of faith. The measure of faith is what God equips you to do in Christ's body. It may be an apostolic measure of faith. It may be a prophetic measure of faith. It may be evangelism, evangelistic measure of faith. It may be a shepherd or a, a teacher measure of faith. It may be an exhorter's measure of faith. It may be those that show mercy a measure of faith. See, the measure of faith is what adapts you to be a contributor yes. Amen. to the people of God. Now, in that same chapter, he refers to this measure of faith, and he says, we have many members in one body, but all members have not the same office. But so the measure of faith now, it translates into office. Not, not office like a room office, or office like a position office. An office. Peter refers to the same thing as being stewards of the grace of God. I'm trying to communicate your faith. I'm trying to defining faith, what faith means here. Peter said this, 1 Peter 4.10, As every man hath received the gift, that's, that's this measure of faith, even so minister the same one to another, communicate, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So here's God's grace is in this ability or aptitude or what you're inclined to do. And you exchange. You exchange what you've received for what the other person's received comes back to you. Amen. Now this will not work under a one-man system. No not work clergy system. It won't work. Yeah. Where everybody comes together and everybody shut up after we sing and listen to this one guy, yeah. this won't work. Yeah. Jesus has got one man communicating, but even he's not receiving anything. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. That communication mm -hmm. of your faith. Now Paul deals with this under the figure of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Spiritual gifts, measure of faith, stewards of the manifold grace of God. It's all talking about the same thing. Talking about how God equips the members to communicate. Yes. Amen. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, he states that there are diversities of gifts. Those gifts, the measure of faith, Manifold grace of God. See, that's, that's what he's talking about. This aptitude. Yes. There are diversities of gifts, but one spirit. Diversity means I got something you can't have unless I give it to you, yeah. and you got something I can't have unless you give it to me. That's, right. Amen. that's the way the body of Christ works, brother. I mean, if, if you just do a little bit of thinking, it'll, your experience will confirm that this is, in fact, the case. Amen. There's some things you know because somebody in the body of Christ mentioned it to you and you didn't know it until they said it. There's some things you said someone else didn't know until you said it. Differences, different diversities of gifts. Then he goes on to say, there are differences of administrations. This is all in 1 Corinthians 12. There are differences of administrations but the same Lord who's over all. 
Now, administrations have to do with the function or the office or the position, whereas a gift has to do with the ability. But they all have to have to do with a function or office that's being filled. A prophet is a function. Yeah, a shepherd is a function or an administration. Actually, in the, in the kingdom of God, a steward is like a vice president that's over some aspect of the kingdom of God. They have like unspeakable of authority in their action, in their office. Like a person who, let's say, has the gift of mercy. They know when to bestow mercy and when not to bestow mercy. They know who needs it and who doesn't need it. They're able to handle that. A person who's received the gift of teaching knows what needs to be taught and who needs to be taught it. Yeah, you can't learn that in Bible college. You can't. We don't mean to denigrate Bible colleges. Well, in a sense, I do too, but you, you can't learn that that way. This is something God's running. And he says there are differences of operations. So it's diversities of gifts, differences of administration, gifts, what you do, administrations, the office you have. There are differences of operations. That's how you do it. There are differences of operations, but God worketh all in all. Amen. Now that's talking about the same thing, our, that's the communicating of our text, that's what it's talking about. So Paul prayed concerning the communication of Philemon's faith or the faithful carrying out of his role in the body of Christ. That's what he's talking about. I've been praying about that, Philemon. Now to me, this indicates that the appropriate prayers of the saints have something to do with being effective in your ministry. The prayers of the saints contribute in some way to that. Now when we read the put on the whole armor of God, the last part of the armor says praying for all saints everywhere. Praying with all perseverance for all saints everywhere. That fits into this here. That they'll be able to Communicate. Amen. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've made some progress here. Uh -huh. We've got a lot of people that can actually communicate. Yeah, that's right. For profit, I mean, it makes you, it builds you up. Makes you this just, just didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Amen. And we had to learn about this. But it's most enjoyable. Yes. <laughs> when you get to this communicating, there's no rivalry. Hey, they communicated more than me. I want to communicate. See, they don't have that. That doesn't happen. See, God arranged things so this doesn't happen. There's no rivalry, no competition. The big toes doesn't say, hey, how about me down here? Stop paying attention to the eyes up there. No, There's no competition in your body. If there is, you, something's wrong. You try and get it straightened out. Communicate your faith to those who already have faith. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is how the head of the church is administrating this activity. He says, I've got a lot to say. Church, I've got a lot to say. And if I just say it in a linear way, just have a non-one-stop speech, we're going to be here a long time, and you're not going to be able to take it in. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to put a little bit here. A little bit there, a little bit more there. I'll get this person to see this there. Then I'm going to give them the ability to say, now's the time to say it. I can tell. Now what I've been given to see, now I see it, now I see. Now's the time I can say it. Then we all profit. Amen. We might have had it taken 20 years if we were just ourselves. Yeah. You see that? <laughs> Communication of your faith. What your faith has brought to you, that's what you communicate. Or exchange. We can see this actually lived out in some of the times of our discussions. You know, there's right. a truth that the Lord has begun to open up That's to right. us. And we have a sense that there's a little bit more assembly that is needed before we can take hold of that. Yeah. When we speak about these things in the assembly, then the brethren bring what they have been given That's to right. bear on that subject, and then we're able to take hold of the truth oh. so that we can profit by it. Amen. Amen. And this is. This is what attributes to a rapid advancement as a body. Amen. 
Now, he just didn't pray that for the faith to be communicated. He prayed that the communication of your faith may become effectual yeah. Yeah. or effective. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, there's different ways the different versions have represented this, as is their custom. So I'll give you five of the views to tell you what it does mean. View number one, this is what I think it means. When Philemon perceives all we could, uh, when Philemon obtain, may, uh, might obtain a full understanding so that you'll have a full understanding of the very thing we have in Christ. That's view one. Be, no, it becomes effectual by acknowledging of every good thing which is in you. So people will be, be able to see, Philemon, what I put in you. How they're going to be able to see it? You'll communicate it. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Here's the second view: that Philemon would have a full understanding, so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. See, I reject that because the kingdom of God is not that kind of kingdom. It's not a self-centered kingdom. Here's a third view: that when Philemon perceives all we can do for Christ, when you perceive all the good that we may have for Christ, so well, Philemon, I want you to be able to see how much there is in Christ to have. Well, see, that's not the point of the text. Fourth one, that it would promote the knowledge of what is ours in Christ. It may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. That's the Revised Standard Version. So that people theoretically can know there must be a lot in Christ. But that's not the point of the text. It's the communication it's the passing of something from one member to another member. That's the point of the text, not increasing academic knowledge. And the fifth view would result in recognition of Paul and his co-laborers, so that they may, though it may result in their recognition in us of everything that's right with reference to Christ. So that you, when you communicate your faith, Philemon, everyone will realize we're really apostles. Well, that's not what the text is saying. I'm proceeding now under the conviction that Paul's prayer regarded the effective ministry of Philemon, which would confirm that what he had he got from God, and it was genuine. Yeah. May become effectual or effective. <clears throat> no spiritual gift is effective that is not productive. Yeah. Amen. Am I right there? Would you agree? That changes your evaluation of a lot of things. <laughs> Members of the body of Christ are not just holding down a position. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what our church believes. We say, well, big deal. What do you have? That's what we want to know. Yeah. I'm not sure they're, they believe very strongly in some of these things anyway. When people rejected what Paul said, he waved goodbye. When they didn't perceive what he had, see, he tried to communicate his faith. He, so he, he illuminated who Christ was and what he did. They didn't receive it. So he said, well, <laughs> that's it. So he left. He did that in Antioch of Pisidia and in Athens. And he rebuked the Galatians for rejecting what he said. But if they did receive it, well, Paul stayed in Corinth for 18 months and he stayed in Ephesus for three years. Why? They were, the communication was effectual. He went down there to Ephesus and he communicated what he knew and they booked people that were, had magic arts and all this sort of thing in the occult. They brought their books and they burned them publicly. Ooh, there ought to be a book burning in Joplin. I've often, there ought to be a big book burning. What was that? The communication was effective. <laughs> and then all Asia heard the word of God while he was at ministry to the school of Tyrannus there. So it was effective. Now there's not uh, much talk these days about kingdom effectiveness. In fact, if you put your ear to the ground, the things they promote as being effective aren't really the kind of thing God is doing. 
God wants you to fulfill your dream. Is that right? If he gave you the dream. Yeah, if he gave you the dream, that's right. If you heard a, had a dream and someone said, come over to Macedonia and help us, then he will fulfill that one. Good, that'd be a better way to present the case. God will give you dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Young man will see vision, but old men will dream dreams. Dream yeah. dreams. Amen. Amen. How will it become effectual? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. See, it's a milestone when you can receive something from God that came through another person, and you recognize it. Yes. Amen. Yeah. I'm acknowledging, oh, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so said it, but I know this came from God. Yes. I'm acknowledging this is from God. Amen. It's good to acknowledge that. Amen. Someone stands up here, one of the men, one of the women, one of the young people, and they speak out something, and it's true, and it benefits yes. you. It's good to say, you know, I got that. It's been effective. I'm acknowledging that this came from God. God gave her that to us right. through this or that mouthpiece. You can do that by saying amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to make a point of that. That's a practical way is to say amen. Right. amen. Paul said at the end of prayer, say amen at the giving of thanks. Uh -huh. Now, I've heard some prayers I couldn't say amen to. Right. Uh, you may be able. I've heard some prayers I, I couldn't hear, you know. Yeah. So I couldn't say amen, but I've heard some prayers. I couldn't say amen to them. You know, when God had the curses of the law read to the children of Israel, he commanded them, after each one, say amen. That's what he said. Say amen after each one. Let all the people answer, amen. That's at the curses. <laughs> said Amen. That's an acknowledgment, see. They used to be in the old-time churches before they had praise bands and this sort of thing, worship leaders. They used to have an amen corner. They, uh -huh. There really was an amen corner. It was up in the front, and all the leaders sat in that section. So when the preachers preached, if they said amen, that meant you can take, you can receive that. Yeah, that's right. If they didn't say amen, say that. Ah. No. I've been a prolific ameter. So when I was uh, working at a certain organization, I was noted for saying amen. I always sat up in the front and said amen when it was appropriate. So the president called me in for a conference one day, and he said, uh, Given, they didn't say brother Given, that was a brother, was for the professors of the school. It wasn't a normal term. He said, I wish you wouldn't say amen so much. They said, well, brother, I'll probably say it more now. <laughs> I said, why, did, why are you asking me not to say amen? Well, he says some of the professors were very upset because you didn't amen what they said. <laughs> so that, this is true. It's because I couldn't. One of the students come to me one day and said, they used to call me Elijah because I had the beard. I said, Elijah? When you amen, does that mean it's okay? And if you don't amen, does that mean it's bad? So that's exactly what it means. <laughs> that's a form of acknowledgement. Right. And uh, I preach at several black churches, and they, you know, they'll ag it's like throwing fuel on a fire. Amen, praise it, you know, and this sort of thing. But that's an acknowledgement. That's, that's, that's the lowest form of acknowledgement. The highest form is when you take what you've heard and you translate it into life yeah, amen. and you adapt your life to it. That, that's, the, that's the highest form of acknowledgement. Well, this uh, burning of the books that you referred to yes. was an acknowledgement that right. the things that they were turning to to be effective in their lives yeah. were ineffective mm -hmm. you know, and they were going to God. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, there are some, you know, the acknowledgement of every good thing. That is, whatever God gives you can in some way be expressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Shall I say whatever God uniquely gives you? Now, there's some things that's common to all believers that are given to them, grace, mercy, and peace, and this sort of thing, hope. That can be expressed too, but we're talking about here your role. And everybody's been placed in the body of Christ where God pleases. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 18. He hath placed every member in the body where it hath pleased him. So you're in there in a profitable position somewhere. Doesn't make how old you are, doesn't make any difference how old you are. Or how young you are, doesn't make any difference. Or what gender you are, doesn't make any difference. You've been given something that will profit the people of God. You may think it's small, but under certain conditions... It can become the most important thing. Like a cup of cold water in the name of a prophet. There's some people that they they exchange a million dollars for a cup of cold water. There's some people that know when to give that cup of cold water. And will acknowledge. Will acknowledge the gift. Every good thing. Every good thing, that's the measure of faith. That's the measure of the gift of Christ. That's the ability God gives you. These are all given to profit with all. The word with all means everybody or the whole body. God won't give you something just for part of the body. That's why I preached a series of sermons on married people is uh, kind of, what do you do for the widows? I mean, what? Single people, young people. See, God doesn't give you something for just part of his people. It in some way ministers to everybody. So there are levels, I understand, where you talk to children, talk to Mary, do what this sort of thing. There are levels like that when you get down to ministering or exchanging. No, that's another matter. That means who you minister to can come back. And this is why the uh, young people's movement is, is, is so crippling. Because they take the young people out of out of the assembly, and they separate them from this ministry of yeah. the gifts. And yeah. so how they don't even most most young people don't even know what it's like to be in the assembly. Yeah. So see that they've crippled their young people, and they don't even know it. Yeah. Amen. Now see when when somebody acknowledges every good thing that God has put in somebody else. That glorifies God. Yes, amen. Some people may not know that God does such things. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, you you minister what God's given you. People say, hey, that came from God. I can tell because of the effect it had on me. Mm-hmm. So that's some, some of the things God does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even in this meeting tonight. Some people testified effectively. When we came here, Mm -hmm. we didn't have a job, Mm -hmm. and we didn't know when or if we were going to get one. Mm -hmm. Now we got two of them. (laughs) Now that does something to someone that's hunting for a job. Someone else testified, I was off work for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was threatened with the loss of my job. Lo and behold, when I came back, they were glad to see me, and I still got my job. She communicated that. Suddenly, some of us recalled similar experiences years ago, similar experiences. God did that to me, too. What happened to whole? There's a consciousness of God that's developed, see? Mm -hmm. Now, Paul says, I'm praying, Philemon, that the communication of your faith will be effective So the people to whom you communicate what you've been given will say, God gave that to him. And God can give it to me too. As the body of Christ grows under those circumstances. (laughs) All right, I'm going to sign off there. Any of you have anything you'd like to add? Yes. This is a good definition of testimony. Mm Something that has been that's good. Yeah. yeah. The meaning of a testimony has been changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people have observed that like, a testimony meeting uh, often becomes, you know, seeing who who did the worst stuff in the past. And, <laughs> but a te- testimony it comes from 
uh, yeah. from witnessing something. I can testify yeah. of that because I'm a witness of it. I'm a recipient yeah. of it. And there's no better testimony than witnessing of what God has given. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Everybody was able to see that, weren't you, tonight? How that how the body works together, and did you see the role of prayer? And I remember we've been talking about prayer. See how the prayer entered in this. One yeah. person prayed that this would happen in another person. Amen. See, so this is a good prayer. Yes, amen. If you know somebody, and you know God's given them something, now maybe they don't live around here, but you know God's given them something, you can pray this for them. Yes, amen. That where they're at. The communication of the faith will be effective and someone will see what God gave them. Yeah. And maybe it'll stir them up to they want it too. Yes, amen. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Sister Tasha. Well, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, given, I like what Isaac said, to stay in the new man, you have to keep feeding yourself of the things of God. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's good. good that's good. Of acknowledging God. That's and, good. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a good mindset to keep. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I like it. Don't push away from the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Gillen. Yes. I think so, I, somebody might have said the other night that we were something like this. So if I'm repeating somebody, forgive me, but we were, we were kind of made to be like vessels. Yeah. To be filled with something and, yeah. then, and, then, and then to share it. So you'll find, because that's the way we were made, you will find that if you operate that yeah. way, it's very it's very satisfying to yourself too. See, people, Amen. there's a lot of, if you're, if you're selfish, you won't get anything. Yeah. yeah. But you, you'll be miserable yeah. yourself yeah. and you'll make everybody else miserable. Yeah. yeah. But if, if you, if you <laughs> say, I'm going to be a vessel and I'm going to let the Lord fill me and then I'm going to share. Mm-hmm. You'll be satisfied, and everybody else will be blessed. Amen. Amen. That's how it works. And we're knit together by what every joint supplies. Yeah. There's no pretension in this either. That that won't be effective communicating if there's pretension in one vessel trying to uh, maybe look like they have more or express something that they haven't seen clearly. But what you've received from the Lord, then that's what you give, and that's what's made effective. Amen. Yeah, and normally when you pour something out of a vessel, you lose yeah. what's in there. Not here, though. But not here. It's yeah. like the oil in, in the widow's vessel that never ran out. She mm-hmm. filled all of the other vessels, yeah. but it didn't run out in her Amen. vessel. And that's, that's how the, the vessels of God work. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about the ministers of the grace of God, being ministers of the grace of God. Now, the gift that we, we've been given yeah. now, that qualifies us for that position in the in the body mm-hmm. that's so that's that, that gift of grace so you know if you um uh, if you need to be a minister of the grace of god mm-hmm. you know uh to god's people which means you've got to have tasted of the grace of god amen it, 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 oh, go ahead you finished it brother tony you finished yeah, okay through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning somewhat you were building the case for it's an order that. Mm-hmm. See, this is this is the work of God and His people. Mm-hmm. God does everything for a purpose. Mm-hmm. And so all of these things are done in order that, and then it, it's, right. it's, it's incorporated or it's driven by His purpose in order that God may be known, mm-hmm. in order that many sons are being brought to glory, mm-hmm. in order that, see, but it's, it's the it, we're watching the working of God. Yes. And uh, the the way that it's done is the best way for God to be known. Amen. Mm-hmm. Gets us greater glory, and then the witness is more potent. Yeah. Well, we're drawn into that purpose. Yes, amen. You know, there's a fellowship in the actual purpose of God as we participate in these things. Mm-hmm. Anyone? Uh, Go ahead. We're coming from, we came from an assembly that, uh, as you said earlier, you know, that, that drives the little ones out of the assembly, you know, takes them over to their room and lets them play and do this and all this other stuff. Well, why do we send, send our kids to school when they're young? It's because they're sponges. Yeah, you take right. them out away from the preaching that's being done in the assembly, yeah. and you take them out to 
play someplace, that sponge is is has been wrung out. That's right. You're right. So you know, I feel like it's more like the ones that are taking them out of there don't know what's being said in the assembly to begin with. Yeah, either. Yeah. Yeah. yeah some... Going to school and we spend the first five years doing recess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some people have, have visited us and they've. They've marveled at the young people and how they pray and how they talk, but see, they do because they're they're in the receiving mode. That's right. Yes, amen. And it's amazing what young children can learn. Yes. Amen. Don't forget Samuel. You know, yes. he was just was just weaned and he wore the ephod and worked yes. in the temple. That's right. Jesus at twelve. Jesus at twelve. That's your model for twelve-year-old. Amen. <laughs> All right, anyone else? All right. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for giving us the privilege of participating in your great salvation, being a conduit through which you can pour blessings upon others, through which you can issue warnings to others. We thank you for giving us the privilege of laboring for souls and uh, seeking to restore and finding sheep and all of these very feeding sheep. We thank you for granting us the privilege of participating in this, being laborers together with you and being joint heirs with Christ. Receive our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.